Okay. All right. Hey, guys, it's Ted Bogert. We are back with the Ted Show. Super excited to have Candy Campbell on the show. We're going to talk about, I love the topic, hope is a narrow blade of grass. I can't wait to get the scoop on that. We're going to talk about a lot of things. Candy's going to share her journey. Welcome, Candy. How you doing? I'm fine. Thank you, Ted. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm super am- excited to have you on. All right. So they love, the audience loves origin story. They want to know all about Candy. They want to know probably your name. We talked about that before we went live. Uh, they want to know about you and a little bit about your journey. And then we can then take a deep dive into the topic and what you're what you're up to now. So give us a little background on Candy. Well, let's see. I was adopted when I was young. My parents were living overseas. And um, I got the fortunate blessing to be adopted into a family who loved me. And, you know, I had opportunities uh, that many could only dream about. I got to travel the world. I got to see places that, you know, at one point, one time in we're communists are no longer anymore. They're open borders. I still wouldn't go back there, but they're open. (laughs) I, you know, I was born into a family that I was the only child of my parents. And I was the fourth child for my father from a previous, he had kids from a previous marriage, but they were not part of his life. So I was essentially an only child. And, um, I was fortunate. I, you know, I believe so. And then as we traveled abroad and, you know, had opportunities, we came back to the States. California was always home for us. And we got the opportunity to, you know, see things, do things, experience things that many had not. Well, when I was about three, um, my parents did not have a really good strong marriage and their communication really uh, lacked. So me being an only child, my mother used me as a confidant. I became that little mini therapist for my mom. I, I didn't offer advice. I just listened and I took things in. And as you know, three year olds don't have the wherewithal to handle adult problems. No, they don't. I took my mom's problems and I absorbed them. I really absorbed them a lot. And being, you know, the personality and the nature that I had, I was always, you know, my mind was always trying to figure out how to fix it, but I couldn't. So as you know, this affected my life. I just didn't know how much it was going to affect my life. I grew up. Did she continue? Did she continue to have that relationship with you? Were you always your mom's confidant? She did. Yes, she did. That's a lot of pressure to put on a kid. How long did that last? Did that last all the way through your childhood and adulthood? It lasted till I left home when I was went to college when I was seventeen. So. Um, yeah, pretty much most of my childhood. And, you know, so my when you say, years. we've already got some questions. When you say um, that it impacted your life, how? It impacted my life because I stopped. I took all this information in and I didn't know that it wasn't mine to handle. And it wasn't, you know, I didn't know how to process it. So I just took it in and put it down. Um. You know, they, as they say, what goes down must come up. Well, I learned the the belief and the behavior of stuffing my emotions, stuffing anything that came up that was negative. I didn't know how to process that. And um, I became what you would essentially would call a, a brewing volcano. I just didn't know it. As I went through life, you know, as I got older and went to school, I I felt awkward. I was kind of like a 
lone bird. I had friends, but I didn't know how to relate to them because I had Why never really think, learned. Yeah, well, so th there was no, so, there's one thing about your mom sharing stuff. Uh, tell me why uh, it's so significant. Tell me why you had trouble uh, building or maintaining relationships, even though you had friends. Was it st was it tr attributed to the confidant role that you had to take? Um, I was always I don't know. People always came to me when they're with their problems. I, I guess I just because I listened. You know, I just had that or about me that I would listen to people and not, you know, not without judgment, just listen. And that is something many people need. Um, my biggest challenge, I think, growing up was, I didn't, you know, like you said, I didn't really know how to relate to people other than in that role. I, you know. So did you not get the, the um, uh, emotional, attention at home? Did you not get that? Is that not why as, it was difficult? Not as much as I needed. Sure. My mom was lost in her own world. So was my yeah. father. I, I, you know, both my parents have, have passed on since passed on. And for a long time, um, I had anger and resentment towards them. Sure. But as I went through, um, as I got older and I went through my own personal transformational journey, I learned that my parents did the very best they could with the circumstances that they knew. Right. So I let them off the hook because holding resentment and anger towards people that are gone yeah. was only hurting me. What was that like to let them off the hook? Because I think a lot of people want to, we all want to let go. I think of the negativity and the anger and the resentment. And I mean, there's so many different words to use, but sometimes we hold on to it because the thought of letting go seems like we're weak, we are giving in, we're acknowledging that they're right. And those are all, even though I, they're valid feelings, they're not necessarily accurate. So when you actually decided, all right, they did what they could, what was that like for you? It was actually rather freeing. When you let someone off the hook for what they've done to you, it doesn't mean that you forget it. Yeah, right. Those, what happened, happened. You can't, just erase that memory. However, you let them off the hook for fixing it or making it right. You free yourself. It's kind of like, you know, they say, it's like you drinking poison, hoping the poison hurts them. Right. It really doesn't. It, it just, it hurts you. And when you hold on to that anger and resentment, it's just like poisoning in the inside of your body. It has to go somewhere. And it comes out, it, it comes out in ways you don't want it to. It makes you bitter, it makes you angry. And when I let go of that, I felt like this big lift come off of me. My parents, you know, people do, the reason people do the things they do is because when, you know, the way they were raised, their own beliefs, it's not like, you know, the majority of us don't go out with the intention of saying, I'm going to hurt you today. Correct. And I hope you feel it. You know, they do it, as they say, hurting people hurt people. Right. And when I looked at my parents and the way they were raised and the circumstances they came out of, they had no alternative or no choice. They had they no um, point of reference. The, the, right. One of the things that happens, obviously, with any kind of issue like that is that you you want to, as most parents want to at least improve on what they dealt with, but that it doesn't always mean that it's the most amazing thing. And so you had, they did what they could based on their knowledge base. And probably like, I think a lot of us, you too, I'm guessing, um, a lot of us base our knowledge base on what we don't want because of what we did experience. And so we build, I know that's how I parent. Um, I mm -hmm. absolutely did the complete opposite of my parents um, because I learned early on what I did not want to do. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people can't break the cycle. You were blessed enough to do that. How? I was blessed enough because, well, <laughs> I'm a pretty strong, dom uh, dominant, determined personality. And I was like, I. I made my fair share of mistakes. My kids will tell you, um, 
Line two, listen. Uh, I, you know, it's humbling when I had, you know, I talked about that volcano and it came out. It's humbling when you have a three-year-old say, mommy kicked a hole in the wall. I'm not proud of it. I did that. I've done it. And I had to apologize. I had to make amends to my kids and say, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry for what I did or what I didn't do for you. I, you know, my circumstances, I'm not, I'm owning, I'm owning my responsibility for what I did. Love or did. And that's the biggest thing is when we take responsibility for what has occurred in our life, good or bad, we can begin to heal. When we stop blaming everybody and expecting everybody else to fix yeah, so what has happened in our lives or is happening in our lives, we can begin to heal. It's so true because I think that accountability and taking responsibility are this, for a lot of people are these outdated thought processes because we are, uh, we have to accept the fact that we're not perfect and nobody likes to accept that fact. So. Instead of correcting things, we just continue to uh, do the same crazy things that didn't do any good for our parents, didn't do good for us as children of our parents. And so we don't know how to break this cycle. Part of breaking the cycle, which I agree with you is, is taking the responsibility of what part of that cycle are you responsible for? Yes, your parents did something to you, didn't give you something, but now you're an adult. so. Where are we going to take the responsibility for how you are allowing that to impact your life? I had to do it as an abused child. Uh, you just have to learn to know that that happened. Like you said, it's very important to recognize it happened. You can't sweep it under the rug and expect yourself to heal from it. But then I'm like, okay, well, I can either spend my entire life being mad about that and let it impact everything I do, or I can move on. I go, you know what? It sucked. I remember it. I'll never forget it. But I am—I refuse to allow that to impact my future. And so I think you made you made a similar choice. You decided I'm not going to do that anymore, even though you had to get there and had to kick in a wall or two in order for it to happen. Well, my revelation came when my mother was dying. Um, in the course of like, for four years, I lost both my parents within 14 months of each other. I lost a four month old and I lost two pets. Oh and, my God, Candy, I'm sorry. And I was on top of it working on a doctorate and working. Um, so, you know, I just, again, I talked about that stuffing. I just, and ignoring the negative emotions that were desperately trying to say, hello, we really need you to process us, you know? Right. Um, I just kept going and I was like this bull in the China shop going and I hit a point where I couldn't go anymore. I was losing that ability to stuff anymore, you know? And, um, I remember seeing my mother on her deathbed. She, when she was dying and she had all these regrets and I remember thinking to myself, you know, you're getting ready to turn 50 in the next year. And I didn't, no matter how long I'm on this earth and in this body, I don't want the next 50 years or maybe 300 years, whatever, to be miserable and reach my deathbed and go, oh, I wish I would have. And so I decided that it was time to change, really change. I had been trying to change, but you know, in that process of losing life and losing people and having to grieve, I slipped into a pit and I hit that, that proverbial wall. And I remember crying out thinking, God, just take me home. Let me go. You know, I don't want to be in this body anymore. Yep. And I remember hearing in the, I, I, there was, I couldn't see anything, but it was as clear as you and me talking. I heard a voice that said, no you have more things to do. And I got mad. <laughs> I was, what the heck? Why won't you let me go? You know, I mean, and I just was like, something inside of me was like, nope, 
you can't go. And I, I felt this stirring in me that said, you've got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get up and try to figure out where you're going to go from here. And I remember that was like, you know, kind of like taking a, a toddler. They're kicking and screaming. They don't want to go. And I was like, okay, there I don't go. know where I'm going. But I started looking and I started finding, I, I found a, a coach that helped me and I went through mentoring and I went through this journey that unearthed all the stuff that I realize now was not healthy. Right. But I had I all along I had buried and I had just like never let myself feel the emotions that were these negative emotions that really desperately were wanting my attention. Because I was so used to going, nope. You're, yep. you're right there, you know, anyway. you can't go. So tell me what hope, before, as we start to wrap up, tell me what hope is a narrow blade of grass means. That is when I was five, I was at my grandmother's and she had a pond and I did not know how to swim. I fell in this pond and as I was bobbing up and down, uh, I really believe that, call it angels, call it guides, call it whatever, whatever you choose to believe, something or someone was holding me up. And because what I was holding onto was a very narrow blade of grass. It wasn't enough for my body weight, but I held onto it with dear life and I was able to yell and scream for someone to come find me. Wow. Had I not, I would have drowned. And that was, you know, and my, my mom took a picture. I, I have it, but it's in a Polaroid picture. She, she saw this blade of grass. I was still had it in my hand when she wow. came to me. And um, that was really literally what figuratively I held on to to get help. You felt you felt i've done this so i get it you have you felt something around you something was 1000% not going to let anything happen to you mm -mm. yeah it's a beautiful feeling i've i've experienced it and shared it on the show before but what i love about your story is that i mean a blade of grass saved you, but in reality, the blade of grass is obviously not what really saved you. Uh, there were other forces at work to make sure you were saved because I, I believe in that. And, and so when you know that as a kid, when it happens to you as a kid, you never forget it. I'm sorry, you just don't. And you don't know that feeling. I don't care what adult would tell me that I didn't feel that. I felt it. I knew. I absolutely knew. And I guarantee you, that's that's how you felt. You you knew it. You can still talk about it and get choked up about it. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Had, right. not, had I not had something holding me up, I would have drowned. I was only five. I didn't know how to swim. I had Listen, flunked swimming. <laughs> there's, and there's no legitimate explanation for that. And so if your mind and heart aren't open to accept the fact that you don't know everything or all forces at work, uh, then you, you're going to cut that off. I truly believe you were saved for a reason. There's a reason. Uh, tell us what you were, we're, of course, we ran out of time, but I don't, I never like to not end a show. I want people to know what you're doing now. What are you, who are you now and what are you doing? I am a, <clears throat> essentially like a transformational healer and happiness coach. I help people, I teach them strategies that can they can have in their tool belt that no matter what life throws at you, you can still have an inner sense of peace and calmness. I love that. So people come to you um, because there's all sorts of different coaches, right? You th there's a coach for every need, and I think that's so important because some people need a cutthroat business coach. They need to be kicked in the butt every day. And if they're not, they're not going to be productive. It makes them happy and it's a good way. And then some people need a you, a healer, somebody who can 
uh, help them with their past because that's obviously the limiting beliefs that are stopping them from reaching their goals, all of the stuff that we talked about. I love that. All right. So how do people find you? What's the best way for them to reach out to you, learn more about you, maybe engage you for a consult? Uh, how do they reach you? Um, I'm on Facebook under candycampbell.net. Um, and you can also do candycampbell.net is my, um, my landing page. So there are ways that you can put in your information. I will reach out. I do do free consultations and, you know, we kind of establish that rapport and see where we go from there. But my biggest thing that I tell pe my clients is whatever I'm teaching you, I promise you I've done myself. So it's not like I'm giving you things to do that I don't know the effects of because I have walked that and I have done that myself. So they do work. And um, it's all about if I can leave you with one thing, Please. just always remember everything begins with a thought. There is that, you know, even doctors recommended that mind body connection, but everything begins with a thought. So what we think upstairs, we walk out in our lives. 95% of our thoughts are subconscious and only 5% are actually on the conscious level. So we have a lot of beliefs and things that occur subconsciously that we just automatically do. We do, so. we absolutely do. All right, you're a joy, Candy Campbell. Um, Thank you. Go check her out on candycampbell.net and on Facebook, candycampbell.net is actually, I know it's interesting. I loved it because I had to type it in three times. So that's actually her Facebook page. Um, so I have tagged her in that on all the platforms. Y'all reach out to Candy. We all need a little healing in our lives. Some of us a lot. There's a lot of work to be done. But if you do the work with somebody who has the experience like Candy does, it can really change your life. So thank you for what you do. Thanks for being on the show. See, it was thank easy. You, Ted. Have a great day. Have a great day. All right, guys. We'll be back later. Reach out to the one and only.